Hey everybody, what's up? Chad Wesley Smith here for Juggernaut Training Systems. Today I'm gonna to be talking to you about utilizing variation as a fatigue management strategy. So getting into a little bit more advanced program design topics. So I'm gonna to be talking about you know, what this is, uh, why it's useful for you or athletes that you coach, and how to implement it. But before we get into that, make sure you like the video, subscribe to the channel, and most importantly, go to the App Store and check out the new Juggernaut AI app. We have our powerlifting AI system now in a mobile app for Apple and Android, power building coming in early 2021. More programs on the app coming after that. So make sure you go ahead and do that. Let's go ahead and jump into this topic. So uh, before we get into it, you know, into the real meat of it, we need to discuss what do these terms mean? What is variation and what is fatigue management? To go more in depth with those, uh, of course, you can check out the Scientific Principles of Strength Training video series, and even more in depth, the Scientific Principles of Strength Training book available in ebook and paperback at jtsstrength.com. Uh, so the first thing, variation, is principle number five, uh, so like priority number five, and it's the strategic alteration of training variables uh, to avoid adaptive resistance. Guess what? I have a whole nother video just about that. You're, you're already down an hour's worth of rabbit holes of videos. Uh, more on that is the, the video directed adaptation versus adaptive resistance. Uh, but it's kind of a short story on adaptive resistance is the longer you do something, the less return, the less result it gives. So the strategic alteration of training variables to avoid adaptive resistance within the specific demands of the sport. So we could go you know, you could do stuff that's way different than squat, bench, and deadlift, or, you know, training for bigger muscles or more force producing muscles. And yes, that would avoid adaptive resistance, but it wouldn't uh, possibly satisfy the goal of powerlifting, the context we're talking about today. So we're going to look at achieving this variation through exercise selection and loading strategy. The next part of things, what is fatigue management? That's priority number three. So a very important one. And uh, more or less, that's the strategic reduction of training stressors to allow for sufficient recovery to occur and uh, adaptations to take place during the time that that recovery is happening. So now that we've sort of discussed our terms, uh, now let's get into why it is useful to use variation as a fatigue management strategy. So essentially, uh, during the course of, of training, we have the, the training process, SRA, Stimulus Recovery Adaptation, uh, principle number four, if uh, you wanna go and watch those videos for more in depth. And each of those factors, you know, as we'll often re refer to a, the length of an SRA curve in regards to a specific lift, there's actually several different uh, SRA curves occurring at once. So let's say you do a squat session and there's an SRA curve going for the neural demands, the neural fatigue that's generated. There's an SRA curve going for the, you know, the structural tendon integrity stuff. There's a SRA curve going for the muscular damage, a muscular SRA curve. And there's an SRA curve going for the technique that you're developing in the squat. And all of those have a bit different lengths. Utilizing variation is gonna allow us to sort of manipulate the length of those SRA curves so that we don't get too down in the hole on like neural SRA or tendon uh, integrity SRA, uh, tendon and joint integrity SRA or muscular SRA. While, st you know, while those may take longer to recover, we don't wanna neglect uh, technical SRA, which is a shorter curve. So uh, utilizing variation is gonna allow us to manipulate that because if you're only using comp competition movements, then you're either going to violate you're going to violate one of those SRA curves in some way. So you're going to have to either go so light to train frequently enough to not violate technical SRA that you're going to probably violate the principle of overload, or you're going to train so infrequently that your technical SRA is going to start to fall off in an effort to satisfy maybe neural SRA, the longest one of those curves. So we, we're going to be able to use you know, variation in exercise selection and loading strategy to help better line up endpoint to endpoint of the sort of average of those different SRA curves. And the stronger you become as a lifter, the more necessary this strategy becomes because the stronger you get, the more stimulus that you're deriving from a single training session because you have heavier weights 
on the bar, you're more uh, able to, you know, really tap into the, the neural force production qualities to lift these near career peak limit weights. Uh, so your, uh, particularly your muscular and neural SRA curves are getting longer and longer. A technical SRA is also actually getting a little bit longer the stronger and more experienced you become, um, but generally not at the same rate. Though this is an example of, uh, of the technical SRA curve getting a little bit longer, meaning you can have less frequent exposures to the lifts without your technique decaying. There, you know, you can point to extreme examples of this. Someone like Konstantin Konstantinov's talk about deadlifting, you know, every 14 days. Yes, but you're not him. You know, you don't have decades and decades of deep practice deadlift technique in you, uh, and you're not pulling 900 during those sessions. So that's why someone with a ton of experience who's extremely strong can still benefit from doing the lifts pretty infrequently. The little bridges would be a good example of this kind of just doing a squat or deadlift every other week. Uh, that's one of the factors at play there. So that's really why it's useful is, is that we're gonna be able to satisfy multiple different length SRA curves. And for the stronger lifters here, elite international elite lifters, uh, this is gonna become more and more important. And for those of you who aren't at that level yet, as you look forward to that level, you know, you'll have something in mind for when you get there. Not necessarily uh, something to do for you now, but this can be employed for beginner, intermediate, advanced lifters, and we'll talk about that a bit more. So we need to understand what makes a movement more or less fatiguing to understand how we can use variation to manipulate fatigue. Uh, so first off, the most important thing is how much weight is used. And in that I'm talking about absolute load, that you know, 400 pounds is more fatiguing than 350 pounds, which is more fatiguing than 300 pounds. After that, yeah, relative load is gonna come into play. Uh, so you know, the percentage of your maximum in a specific exercise that you're using, but generally the heavier weight is on the bar, the more fatigue is being generated. Uh, so we're going to look at using exercises that allow us to, to lift more weight, uh, something like a board press, maybe a mechanical overloading exercise, is going to generate more fatigue, especially neural fatigue, than something that's a bit more self-limiting, like maybe a feet up bench press, where pretty much no one can lift as much weight as they can in their regular competition bench press, so that, you know, that 400 pound lift on the board press versus the 300 pound lift on the feet up bench press, even if those were actually the same relative intensity, the same percentage of your maximum, 400 pounds more fatiguing than 300 pounds. Next thing to consider with that though is range of motion. So in that specific example I just gave, board press is shortening the range of motion. So it's not gonna be as fatiguing as 400 pounds from the chest would have been, but still the, the first thing we wanna look at is absolute load. So the range of motion that you're using, let's go to the deadlift for example, uh, pulling a deficit deadlift with a longer range of motion than a uh, block pull with a shortened range of motion. If you did it at the same absolute load, deficit deadlift more fatigue than the block pull. So range of motion is also gonna affect the weight that is used and the mechanical stress on the body, particularly in the bench press as you get into like extended range of motion bench pressing with something like a cambered bar. Uh, that's going to put such great mechanical stress on you know, the pec, uh, bicep, tendon, that, that pec attachment, that that has its sort of own unique uh, fatigue and is lengthening specifically the, the tendon joint integrity SRA curve as we go. As we look at exercises that generate the most fatigue, on the top of the list, and we're going to say that these are level five exercises or five uh, fatigue, are going to be mechanical overloading variations. Uh, that's going to be things like reverse band work, um, you know, shortened range of motion, whether that's a squat from pins or a high block, uh, assistance work through something like the slingshot. Uh, for sumo deadlifters, block pulls could fall into that category as well. Uh, and then as we go down the list, looking at this first list for the squat, you know, we've got low bar, more fatiguing than high bar, more fatiguing than front squat, more, those are more fatiguing than belt squat, leg press hack squat variations. And then finally, looking at unilateral variations down at the bottom of our list at number one. Uh, there's a one level of fatigue. Same idea for the bench press with the mechanical overloading up on top. Bench press stuff is a little bit, uh, you know, more gray area here in the middle with like close grip and wide grip. 
because you know we talked about absolute load and we talked about range of motion. Close grip has longer range of motion, but wide grip has more mechanical stress on the on the pec attachment. Um, you know, they might be about equal in weight, or, but it'll vary for person to person. So not quite as big of a you know, discrepancy through these middle exercises on the bench press, but as you get into the less fatiguing movements like machine pressing and then your assistance work like skull crusher, dumbbell raises, tricep pushdowns, that type of stuff. In the deadlift, same idea, mechanical overload on the top. Uh, so like a reverse band deadlift, sumo block pulls right below that, deficit pulls with the longer range of motion, probably more fatiguing than just a deadlift from the floor because you're using just about as much weight and how big a deficit it is comes into play. Um, you know, how much better you are from the floor than the deficit comes into play. But you know, all of this is, it's not a perfect system. So let's use some common sense with it as well. Working our way down to the level one exercises for the deadlift, like back raises, reverse hypers, GHRs. So now that we have a better understanding of what makes an exercise more or less fatiguing, now we can look at how to potentially set this up. Um, and the frequency you have is going to kind of dictate the way that this has to happen. And we have shockingly a whole nother video about that called finding your frequency. So, you know, go take that 25 minute deep dive and learn, uh, learn what the right frequency is for you. But more often than not, more frequency is going to be better. It's going to help you develop better technique, but not necessarily realistic that you do competition bench pressing on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. For some of you that could be realistic, but a lot of you might need that frequent exposure to bench press type of movements to maximize your progress, but aren't capable of competition bench press three times a week. So that's where we get into this undulation strategy. And the way that I like to do that is through a high, low, medium structure. So the high day being where we're picking those you know, three, four, five on our list of most to least fatiguing exercises, those, those higher fatiguing exercises. The low day is maybe where we're picking the one, two, or three exercises, and the medium day is that two, three, four uh, kind of range. And where you fall in that range is gonna depend on how strong you get. So the stronger you get, the greater undulation you're gonna need between sessions, and the more uh, fatiguing movements you pick as your primary days is also going to necessitate a, a greater reduction. So if you are doing mechanical overloading work on, on one day, a five, uh, it's more likely that you're going to need a one or a two on your low day. So if, you're, if your high day is a five, probably a one or two on the low day. If your high day is a four, yeah, maybe a two or a three, you know, and, and then with the, the medium day reflecting that as well. So again, common sense needing to be applied. But a example way that you could structure this for a more beginner lifter. So let's say less than three years of experience. If you're looking at a lifter classification, uh, you know, class three or four uh, total is probably appropriate here for the bench press. On your high day, yeah, competition bench press could be your go-to. And because you're not that experienced, you're not that capable of generating a ton of stimulus with that lift, we don't need to undulate too much throughout the week, but just enough. So using one of those more mid-range exercises like a spoto press, which uh, I personally can't go as heavy on. If you're someone who can go heavier on the spoto press than the regular than the regular bench press, like Marissa is like that, then don't choose the spoto press here as your low day. But if you're not as strong at it, uh, then spoto press could be your low day, and then the medium day maybe a close grip or wide grip bench. If you're uh, a more advanced lifter and you need a, you know, more undulation because you're more capable of generating that big stimulus and the fatigue that comes along with it, your primary day could still be competition bench press, but now your low day is gonna need to be something a bit less fatiguing. So a dumbbell bench variation could be appropriate there or a, a machine pressing uh, variation as well. And then on your medium day, your medium day needs to be you know, because your high day is really high, your low day is really low, the medium day, you know, depending on how strong you are, either right in the middle or maybe, you know, a two or three. So something like a spoto press could be a good option there. And if you need even a bit more reduction in uh, intensity, because you, you need to train to get, you know, to reach 
your volume landmarks, you know, your MAV that we're looking for working towards your MRV, and you want to get enough exposure to the pressing movements to keep your technique sharp, uh, doing something like a feet up spoto press uh, is just a, sort of that extra degree of uh, variation to use as a fatigue management tool. In the squat, the beginner lifter might be looking at low bar on their first day, uh, a front squat in the middle of the week and high bar squats later in, later in the week. Or maybe you, know, you, you don't even need that much undulation, you're going low bar, high bar, low bar. And there's so many factors to take into account with that. It's not you know, just the weight on the bar, but it's also you know, do your elbows and shoulders kill you from low bar squatting? There's, I, I couldn't low bar squat every week at the peak of my powerlifting career, let alone multiple times in a week. So I was low bar early in the week, high bar later in the week, and the next week was high bar, high bar. Um, but that consideration is gonna be a little bit different for each person. So beginner lifter, maybe low bar, front squat, high bar, not a ton of undulation throughout the week, while the advanced lifter, their low bar squat day is so heavy and so fatiguing that they need to make their low day something much, much less fatiguing, like a belt squat or leg press, maybe even a split squat variation, and then their medium day is the front squat. And then we can create further manipulation of these days through the intensity. So if you walk, go back and watch the principle of overload video, we talk about these ranges you know, for hypertrophy, for general strength, and for peaking. So putting, if your high day is the most fatiguing movement and at the higher end of the range, let's say for general strength, you're up there at you know, 85 to 90% for uh, sets of three, you're going to a three rep max. Then on your low day, maybe you pick a, a less fatiguing exercise variation and load it more towards the bottom end of our general strength range, like you know, 70 to 75% for sets of five or six reps. So there's so many you know, extra little tweaks if you need a little bit more uh, fatigue management in between these sessions or a little bit less, you could have a bit more flat from session to session. Uh, if you can't tolerate that much frequency or you don't have that time in your schedule to be getting to the gym, you know, three times a week, you could take this undulation strategy and stretch it out or over the course of two weeks or three weeks. Uh, and I talk about that more in depth in the video, undulating periodization strategies. So go ahead and check that out. So hopefully this gave you a good idea of how to use variation to manage fatigue so you can get more quality training in uh, in your week in the same time. So we can you know, be pushing those MAV, MRV numbers up so we're satisfying the SRA curves uh, for muscular, neural, tendon and joint integrity, and of course, technique as well. So if you like the video, well then, press the like button, subscribe to the channel, send it to your friends, um, all that good stuff. And if you listen to all of this and you're like, oh my God, I'm so overwhelmed. I don't know how to make a program. Well, you're in luck because uh, you could go to the Apple or Google Play store and download the Juggernaut AI app. We've got the powerlifting program on there and it's gonna make totally customized programs utilizing strategies like I just talked about for you. And it's gonna make the program as specific for you as I would say humanly possible, but it's not humanly possible to make it as specific as it is. So uh, machinely possible, is that, the, is that the term? I'm not quite sure, but thanks for watching. Uh, go check that, the app out, Juggernaut AI app for Apple and Android. Thanks for watching.